Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Real Women Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman Global Community Facebook group. I'm Jenny Robertson, one of the hosts of the Real Women Real Purpose talk show, and I'm also the founder of the On Purpose Woman Global Community and the founder and publisher of the On Purpose Woman magazine. I'm here with Julia Mattis, and Julia is a real estate transitional specialist, a real estate coach, a leadership coach, a mentor, and a longtime friend. And we're going to be talking about lessons she has learned from 31 years in business. Thanks for being here, Julia. Oh, Jenny, thanks for having me today. It's so great to see you and so great to see everybody. I know, I miss you. I know, I want to hug you. I, I know, hug you. I know. One day, one day, huh? One day, right? Yeah. Oh, Lord. And for those of you who have not had the pleasure of knowing Julia, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her. Julia Mattis has been a successful licensed, licensed, licensed realtor and team that. leader with Remax Advantage Realty and has been practicing in the community for over 30 years. She's also been recognized as a top producer and is ranked in the 2018 and 2019 top 100 realtors in the Baltimore metro area. Woohoo, Julia. How's 2020 going? I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. like, yes, really. Additionally, Julia serves as the board president at her church and has been an active member of the Oneness CSL community in Columbia, Maryland for over seven years. In addition to serving on the board of trustees, she's also co-leader of the women's group, is a member of the spiritual leadership team, and serves on the heart to heart team. As a licensed science of mind practitioner, she endeavors to bring spiritual practices and principles into all aspects of her personal and professional life. Julia and her husband Garth have hosted over 31 international exchange daughters from around the world and currently have 20 global grandchildren and counting. Julia also serves as commissioner for the Howard County, Maryland Commission on Aging and serves as treasurer for the Heritage Housing Partnership, which provides affordable housing options in Howard County. Her other board includes work on Howard County tourism, the village in Howard, the Howard County Association of Realtors, the Howard County Million Dollar Real Estate Club, and on the Senior Advisory Board for Remax Advantage Realty. When not volunteering for her church in the community, Julia enjoys playing golf. Now, Julia, when somebody reads your bio out loud like that, do you ever go, how do I do all that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know, it's funny, too, because with, um, with the ad advent of, um, uh, of this new pandemic and this new world reality that we're living in, it actually is easier to do more. I don't know if you find the same thing, but, um, you know, I used to spend half of my day just driving to things, right? Right. So um, having this opportunity to just be able to uh, sit down and have a drink and turn the heat, you know, turn the computer on is actually making it much easier to gave, engage. And I find, I don't know about you, but I have found that this format actually, it's made a lot of the groups I'm on a lot more productive, right? Like we don't mm -hmm. have the same small talk we used to in the back over coffee, please come sit down, you know, everybody I, I now that we've all gotten used to this Zoom format, I find that our meetings are far more productive than they ever used to be. That's a great point. And also, I think it was a couple of months ago, I calculated how much time I would have typically spent mm -hmm. on the road, just going to my nine meetings. I don't go to all mm -hmm. of them, but you know, and I realized how much that was. And I thought, well, then I've got all this extra time. I should probably get some more stuff done, you know, but I also found for a while that I was meandering down a lot of other paths I wouldn't have gone down. Oh, I'm at home so I can do 18 Zoom calls a day, you right. know, and got too busy, too too much Zooming. And so I had to look <laughs> at that out. again and kind of cut back <laughs> on some of that again. So um, I know sometimes when I when somebody reads my uh, bio, I'll, I'll go, whoa, they're talking about me because it's, it's also an impressive, you're an impressive woman. And not only are you so successful <clears throat> in business, but the way you give to the community. And while your expertise is in real estate, you're very well-rounded and you do have this deep spiritual life and you do have this um, big, like, I think, global perspective from, you know, having all of those exchange daughters in your home over the years. For how many years have you been doing that? Uh, we started hosting in 1997. What and was the last um, one? We six years ago. We stopped hosting six years ago. My parents um, became my newest exchange students. Um, my, my, they sold their house in New Jersey and moved in with us about five or six years ago. And because of dementia issues and health issues, 
I felt like at that point in time, I would be saddling myself with too many, <laughs> too many obligations because, um, you know, our parents don't go away. The kids we get to send away when their year's over, right? Right, so, right. Yeah. So, so six years ago was our last daughter. And um, it, it, sadly enough, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, you know, fast forward, a lot of these organizations are now folding. I would imagine. Because, yeah. yeah, because, um, you know, a lot of kids got stranded overseas and vice versa. A lot of kids got stranded here and couldn't get out of the country because of the pandemic. So just a lot of things that have that are going to change the way the world looks when we go mm -hmm. back to sort of a, our new, whatever our new normal is going to look like. Right. Well, things that a lot of us don't think about unless we're right in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. How people and how people really are affected. Absolutely. Absolutely. We were supposed to have our German daughter and her husband come visit in May and our Danish daughter and her three kids were coming in May. And, you know, typically we take a, we take at least a trip every two years to go back over to Europe and visit as many as we can. And so now of course we're banned as Americans, we're not allowed to come to Europe. I know. Um, yeah. So there's just, there's just so many things that, uh, yeah. Yes. So we're going to talk about lessons. You've been around in business for almost 31 years and you've mm -hmm. learned a lot. And I, as I said, your, your expertise is in real estate, but I would imagine that a lot of the lessons you've learned could be translated into any business, mm -hmm. any, any endeavor out there. So talk a little bit about some of those lessons. Just, um, just tell me what's the most important lesson that you think you've learned over these years. The most important lesson is to always do you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Always do you. I think especially, uh, and I know this was true of me when I was very early on in my career, the me that I did was what I thought my version of what people wanted me to be was. Yeah. Um, so I think that just from that standpoint, maybe this is just something that comes with age anyway. Um, I think there is this um, real sense of knowing who I am and understanding that doing me in any situation um, is, 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 I think, the, always the best way to operate. And, and I think people get to know you and your sense of who you are. And no matter where you are, showing up authentically in each of those different places really becomes, you know, in, in the old days, there used to be this big push of, you know, uh, market yourself and, and brand yourself and get your name out there. And, you know, Ginny, I have found, you know, you and I have known each other and been friends for what, 20 years? I'm um, thinking, yeah. About yeah, that. 20 years. I mean, I still have women from our group, right? Even our, our original group going back 20 years ago that I still know and I still stay in touch with. And we may not see each other and we may not come together like we did, but there's just this sense of connection that has never disappeared. And I think that's because, and I think I really learned this in being in your groups, was this, was this real invitation um, to allow women to show up. Because, you know, as you used to say with your own experiences of why you created this networking group was because there wasn't a place for women to just show up and be themselves. You went to men's networking groups and you had to pretend to be a man, right? <laughs> or you had to pretend to network as men do. Mm -hmm. And I think there just has to be, I think in order to be authentic to yourself and for people to begin to trust you and know you, and want to work with you, there just has to be this collective agreement that who we show up as really becomes the door that opens to what we do. And mm -hmm. I think early on, you and I talked about this a long time ago, you know, for a long time, you start to identify yourself with what you do. And that's a very male driven, man driven concept. I'm the CEO, I'm the VP, I'm the marketing this. And I think women take that on and I think it's so antithetical to how we really work in the world and how we really show up in the world. Um, the titles really matter. Titles, yeah. yeah, right? Like titles. So it, like to go back to your question about, you know, you reading the bio, like I'm so unfazed anymore by that, right? Like I'm so unfazed about it. It's not, it's not that. It's just how I show up and how I give back is a function of how people want to label me, but that's not necessarily why I do it. Mm -hmm. um, nor has it been for a long time. And I will tell you that there were years when that was the reason why I did it. Like, I want to be part of this thing so people know who I am and give me business and I'm really successful and it's really wonderful and I grow the ladder. Blah, blah, blah. And there was that. <laughs> and it was, yeah. it was I, I crashed and burned from that, right? Mm -hmm. Because there was just this, this, 
the longer that went on, the greater became the sense of detachment from who I really was, right? The core being of my soul, I guess is the best way to say it. And, you know, when the market crashed in 2007, 2008, it was probably, you know, in, in hindsight, at the time, it felt like the worst possible thing that could have ever happened to me. But in hindsight, it ended up being the best possible thing that ever happened to me because it allowed me within the safety of an economic collapse, right, to use that as an excuse to redefine how I was going to re-show up in the world when things got back to normal. I guess is the best way to say it, mm -hmm. you know, and I used to tell, and I do, I still, I still, still tell people that when I got into this business, I thought it was about houses, right? Like that's what it's about. Houses, get those houses sold, get them moved. How many units, how many, blah, 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 right? And then after this kind of crash, you know, part of it was understanding that that didn't fill my soul. I didn't realize it at the time, but now it's not about the houses. It's about the people. And it's about the connections and it's about how do we get people through this transition. And that's been sort of a huge like pendulum swing for me. And that crash allowed me to take that time to heal and to also help me redefine how my business was going to look when I came back in in 2010 and 11. Well, there's so many things I want to respond to that you just said. Uh, one thing came to mind, you know, I worked for a seminar company for a number of years that did a lot of personal growth and spirituality work. And we had this concept, then we taught this, um, this idea of your circles most congruent. And the idea was that, you know, this circle right here would be me and this circle right here would be who I show to the world. And to the, ex to the extent that they are really far apart, that will be the level of joy that we're missing in our lives. So the farther apart they are, probably the more miserable we'll be and that you at least want them to be touching. You want them to, you know, ideally it would be like that. And I think a lot of us hit those sometimes, but you know, it's a hard place to stay in, but you at least want them congruent. You at least want them touching each other because that whole idea and, you know, coming up in a male dominated corporate environment, like I did, not only could I not be, I, I felt could be me, but I couldn't even be a woman. <laughs> you know, I had to be this, um, don't ever let you see them, don't, don't let them see you cry, don't let them see you get too emotional, or, you know, sitting in meetings and having my ideas not listened to, but yet the guy over here who had the same idea after I did, you know, those kind of things. So we put up this armor that it took me a number of years to put little chinks in. So you, this started about then 12 years or so ago with you, correct? Yeah, I mean, it was something that I think process was, you'd been in, I would imagine. That. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I think that, you know, um, we had a we had an incredible uh, seller's market, right, starting in the early 2000s. So I've been in this this business long enough that I've seen, I think, probably safe to say four ups and downs in the in the real estate market. So um because we had a most people don't know or don't remember that back in the 90s, we had another um Prior to the, 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 the banking meltdown in 2007, 2008, we'd had a mini meltdown, the savings and loan. That oh, had was in the industry in, when that happened. Yeah. Yes. So that was in the 1990s. And then there was actually one right when I got into the business that was starting to come out of um, in, 19, uh, in the late 1980s. There was a, another, another sort of uh, market downturn in 89 and 90, which we had, it was a commercial banking collapse um, at that time. So... So I've been kind of up and down through this, but I think what ended up happening was the, um, when we really, things really started to take off in the early 2000s, um, I mean, we were just, uh, of course I was much younger then, but I mean, we were working seven days a week, uh, you know, a hundred hours a week, trying to just keep up with the insane market that had started, um, when Clinton was in, in um, was president, he was the first president to actually decouple the 30-year bond treasury notes from the interest rates, because he, he uh, being the um, uh, sort of economic genius that he was, understood that the economy, countries weren't going to want to buy a 30-year treasury note. They wanted shorter, shorter um, uh, economic, I guess, engagements with our country. Uh, so that's really when the interest rates really took their first no, nosedive. And I say that Clinton, with all the changes that he did, was actually responsible for all the future real estate um, craziness, crazy markets that we had. 
because as people began to understand that, they begin to use interest rates more as a tool to, to sort of um, you know, spur the economy along rather than being a slave to it. Um, so we really had some crazy, crazy early 2000s. And we were growing a team. At that time, I had 19 agents working for me. Um, it was really kind of the beginning of that whole team concept, um, which is now actually standard. Back then, it was very unique. Um, so I had 19 agents working for me, and I was doing all kinds of craziness. So it kind of started earlier than that, because I really started to feel kind of exhausted and burned out before even the crash hit. Yeah. Um, kind of burning the candle at both ends at that point. So that's why I say it was kind of fortuitous when it happened, because it did all sort of come together at the same time for me. And as I said, at the time, I was kind of, you know, hitting my 40s. And I was at the point where I was like, yeah, I've been in business 20 years, I should be able to kick back and it'll just come into me and the referrals. And, you know, then suddenly you have the you have the rug pulled out from underneath you. And it just shifts and, and causes you to all the things that you thought that all the things I thought that were going to happen to me at that point in time in my life, literally disintegrated, right? Evaporated. That old, the, uh, the, the movie um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, where he's got to step out into the void. Like there was nothing <laughs> yeah. there for me to step on. Like only, you know. So yeah, so it was really kind of now in hindsight, as I said, um, a, a wonderful opportunity to kind of review what had brought me to that point. And, you know, after that crash, a lot of agents did not get back into the business. A lot of them, for them, that was it. I mean, it was so sudden and so severe that many, many, many people, many of my fellow professionals never recovered from that. Well, Joy, share a bit about uh, what's different now because um, there's gonna be women listening, watching who know that they are not doing their business maybe the way they want to or not showing up as fully themselves. What is different? How do you how are you in business differently now that the authentic piece is so is so front and center for you? Like based on how you were doing something 20 years ago and how you're doing it now. You well, sure. So I think the, the biggest thing that I see people getting swept up into is getting lured by this internet, um, uh, this lead generator, or this workshop, or this, this, and this, this. And I think what happens is, I think it causes us, it causes me a lot of anxiety. Because what happens is, I look at my business and say, okay, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Rather than taking stock of everything that I'm doing right. Mm -hmm. And I think there's this tendency to, and I know in my business, I sit back and I said to myself, oh, how do I do business with the millennials? How do I do business with the millennials or Gen X or whatever this next generation is? And at some point in time, I just had to sit back and say, those aren't my people, mm -hmm. right? Like those aren't my people. So, I mean, I hired an agent for whom that's her people. Um, I mean, I'm old enough to be almost their grandmothers, right? Like, uh, even though I haven't seen myself as having aged at all, um, I, there, there's a realistic part of me that says, you know, that's, those aren't my people. There's enough of my people out there that I focus on and work with my people. And that's my generation or um, people that I've known for a long time. And I think uh, the other thing I've, I've done, Jenny, which I think people have forgotten is basics, right? There are just basic marketing principles that we forget because we get pulled in all these different directions. Like I still- it's not the post object stuff, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at, you know, 6,000 postcards that are ready to go out. So I still send, you know, I still send 2,000 postcards or 4,000 postcards every month. Um, I still make the follow-up phone calls. I'm looking at my holiday card mailing over there. Um, I think that there are just, there's, there, people in business have to decide what they want to be, right? And I don't think, unless you've got a really big company, if you're a, I don't want to say small mom and pop, because that, that, in my opinion, sort of diminishes the description. I think that we just choose what size business we want to have, right? Um, so I know from having had 19 agents working for me, that really wasn't my shtick. That wasn't my thing because I wasn't working with customers. I wasn't right. working with clients. You just managed. And I, mm -hmm. I love that, right? I really loved that. And that was, again, part of my 
reevaluation and reassessment of, of, of what I wanted to do with my life. So I do a lot of estate sale work right now. I deal with people that are um, um, dealing with loss and trying to be a neutral party with families who perhaps aren't getting along in the sale of the house. Um, I, I enjoy those things. I enjoy the aspects of my business that I deal with a lot of agents who send me a contract and I never hear from them again. Like to them, that's the business. Sell the house, make the money. See, I'm moving on. And I don't want to complain, but it's like I'm, I, I end up handling both sides of the transaction because there's so few people who don't understand the art of our business. Um, and that writing the contract and closing the deal is the easy part. Like literally, that's the easy part. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole process on the front end and the back end that goes in that people in our industry just aren't learning anymore. Um, and, and so I think, I think in business, it's really important to be true to yourself and, and, and have a talk with yourself. Um, you know, we had a wonderful um, coach who used to come to our, our women's group and, um, oh, what was the name of her company, Jenny? She's up in Pennsylvania now. Um, oh, she had the dogs. Oh, Your goodness dog. gracious. Um, I'll think of her name. Wow. Anyway, we had a, we had a, we had a, we had a seminar with her. She came out to the Frederick group and she went through with us. Um, you have to do like a, an assessment every year with yourself. Who do you want to serve? How do you want to show up? And just kind of like a basic bullet point of rather than setting goals. And that was the one thing I got from that seminar was rather than setting goals and the number of transactions, like who do you want to serve? How do you want to show up? Who do you want to be? What fills you up? What makes your life have meaning? Because that's the juice of life that, that opens up, you know, opens up your spiritual essence to allow those things to flow into you. Right. And so I think that's, what's really important in business is to always have those talks with yourself and to try not to be lured away by this special and that special and this person calling up, wanting to sell me leads and Zillow wanting me to sign up for, for zip codes. I've been able to do uh, the kind of volume I do every year. I mean, I personally sell anywhere from 80 to hundred houses a year just from this, the basics, not, not from buying leads and not from, you know, being in all these kind of um, leads groups, although those are always nice. It's just sort of this sense of knowing who I am and how I'm showing up and what I'm good at and how, what I have to offer to people who want that service. I mean, it's true that there are a lot of agents out there that are transactional and they're just going to get your house sold. That's awesome. But if that's not the experience that you want, then there's people like me who offer all the other intangibles and all the other things that go into that process that are not always part of that, put a sign in the yard, put a lockbox on the front door and get her done. Mm -hmm. It's such a great number of points that you've made. And what I think about too is that if you're out there being something for everyone, if you're like morphing into this, well, they need me to be this way, they need me to be that way, or you're not being true to yourself or you're taking clients that you know aren't a good fit, what happens, I think, is that you're going to get more of those people that don't want who you really are. And so you get almost stuck in that box of, well, I'm, I'm pretending and I'm, I'm acting like this is me, but it's not. So I keep attracting the wrong clients. And then it's even, does that make sense? It's even oh, yeah, no. to kind of break out of that mold because now you're comfortable, not really with yourself, but you're comfortable maybe financially or something else is going on. So when you're in the flow like you are, you tend, I would imagine, to get more people who mirror your own values, your own sense of how you want to do business. Mm -hmm. so yeah, so I, 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 I was laughing it. when you said that because one of the, what, the one slice of our industry that a lot of agents really don't like is working with people who are downsizing or older people who are looking for like 55 plus housing because it, it's a much more complicated process because especially when people are downsizing going from bigger houses to smaller houses there's so much that has to happen mentally and emotionally to really make that kind of a successful transaction and it's one of the most time consuming in our business because you end up spending a lot of time with people um, 
just spending time with them. Like sometimes that lead up, you know, a friend of mine just bought a house around the corner from me in a 55 plus community. And it took me two years to get her there. But I, I love it. Like I, I really enjoyed getting to know her and I enjoyed this process of helping her really find the place that was right for her. And um, yeah, so that's why I laugh because there's a lot of people in our business and because um, I work in the 55 plus genre quite a bit, uh, even in listings. And I have a lot of agents who just want to push a contract at me and just be done with it. And there's, there's just so much richness, especially when people are in that stage of their life, getting to know them, right? And what yeah. brought them there and kind of their stories and, and finding out who they are. It's yeah. Yeah, I get that. I get that. But on the side, I really think that should change soon to like 75 plus, don't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because well, yeah, I'm not one of those people and I've been in one of those people for a really long time now, but yeah, that's another story for another time. Yeah. A couple of drinks too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Julia, I know one thing you want to talk about today is that you, you believe and you operate from this place that buying and selling a home can be fun can be a spiritual and inspirational experience mm -hmm. when it's typically, or for many people, one of the most stressful things they'll ever do, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So how is that possible? How, how can that be possible? Sure, so I'll give you an example. Um, I actually got referred to a couple who called me yesterday and they're not planning to move until next year. Um, so I, there are some things about my management upbringing and my management training with Hilton Hotels and a couple of other corporate uh, experiences that I had sort of interweaved in, in and out of my um, real estate career. And one of my favorite, favorite management uh, philosophies um, is start with the end in mind, Stephen Covey. Mm -hmm. um, I read Stephen Covey's work, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, and it transformed my business. That was another thing that was kind of transformational for me because helping people to understand that even if you are in dire circumstances financially or you're just making this choice, one of the things that we don't do anymore in this world is we don't train people to think complex sort of long-term plans, right? People make decisions and they want to move tomorrow. They make decisions. But I'm finding, and what I really enjoy is kind of coaching people through this process. So as I explained to this uh, client yesterday, I'm going to go to their house and we're going to map out a 12-month strategy and a plan. And I told her, I said, at the front end of this process, I am your project manager. And we create a plan of what's going to unfold each month. And I come and check on you each month and figure out where you are in the plan and how can I help you? Because when we get to next September or October, I said so much is gonna happen in that time frame so quickly that taking all these other pieces and doing them over 12 months, first of all, I think in real estate, the reason why things are not fun for people is because things happen so fast and they're overwhelmed and they have a lot of things to think about. They have to handle the mortgage and they gotta worry about a contract and home inspections. But I think having these, these, these conversations, even if it's, if, it's, if it's a quick reaction, even if you have to sell next week, we don't sit down and talk to each other anymore. And especially with COVID, uh, we send documents by DocuSign, right? We push them out to our clients and they go bip, 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 and the contract is signed. And then later they figure out, oh, maybe I should have read that thing. Oh. Right, right. I mean, this is it sounds basic and fundamental, but it's it's a thing now. So I think even just from sitting down and reading through a contract with someone so that they understand what they're signing. But it's really kind of putting in place. And I tell people when I meet with them, the process that I will put together for you, I can move people in two weeks and I can move people in two years. With because it's the same process. All we do is change the timeline. So I think the more clear and the more organized people can be about moving into this process, I think the better off it is and the more fun it is because then it turns it into a, oh, I'm looking for a house, not, oh, I'm managing a process, right? Because it takes mm -hmm. all those things kind of off the table. And I imagine that becomes kind of a fun thing for them. Yes. And they feel like they're actually in, in more control than they would feel maybe otherwise, like things are happening to them sometimes rather than they're making them happen. Mm -hmm. 
or they're happening the for them. Yeah, right? exactly. And there's such a small distinction there. But when a lot is going on at the same time, and it's a weird thing about change. I find that when people open the door to change, it's never about one thing, mm. right? They're getting married, they're having a baby, they're buying a house, they're moving. It's never about just one thing. So I think that even just in the process of entertaining the idea of making a change, no matter what it is, everything starts to change around us. Julia, I've lost your sound. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, so I think that 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 that's part of. So I think as realtors, um, I think there's this perception, and it's something that I think just is industry wide that we're salespeople. Mm -hmm. And I really, I think it's. I don't think it's about sales at all. Or at least my approach is, it's not about sales at all. It shouldn't be about sales because you know I, the other thing I also tell people, my clients when I'm working with them is. I'm full of cliches. I just love cliches. But to me, my cliches actually have meaning. And that's the difference. So I tell people it's so easy, it's so easy to find a house, but it's a, it's very difficult to find a home, or it's much harder to find a home. Mm -hmm. And that distinction is so important because I do see a lot of people making quick decisions, buying a house, and then getting into the house and going, holy crap, what did I just do? Or even worse, because of GPS, people get into their house and then they look out the front door and go, where am I? Right? Without really understanding where the house is, what the neighborhood is like. haven't even checked out the community necessarily. Yeah, 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 just kind of like basic stuff like that. So I, I have a lot of fun with first-time home buyers, especially because we have that conversation, right? I start out by saying, especially if they're a newly engaged couple or newly married, I say, you know, you each have a different vision of what home is, and a lot of it's driven by how you grew up. And so this journey becomes one of us understanding what does this mean to you together now, right? And a lot of these conversations may feel confrontational or they may feel uh, like you're having tough conversations, but really understand that what you're doing is shaping the shared vision of the home that the two of you are creating together. You know, some people grow up in apartments, some people grow up in single families, in the country, in the city, in townhouses, and they come together and they're not always coming from the same background. Yeah. So how can we expect them to make a decision, the largest decision probably at that point in their life without having an understanding where the other person is coming from and what those expectations or how that has been shaped in their brains? What a great service that is, though, as well, because that could, depending on the couple, that could open up some other conversations mm -hmm. because it affects every area of our life, what, what we came from. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. I was just reminded of when my first husband and I were getting married, I was still living in West Virginia. He was up here and I came up to visit my sister and to make some plans with him. And he was all excited. It was just a few months before the wedding because he had seen, he'd seen this apartment for rent in Baltimore and he wanted to show me the building. I couldn't see the apartment yet. And his brother and sister-in-law lived in the same neighborhood. And we're driving, it's in the city and we're driving there and I'm looking around and it's all row houses, what I called row houses. And ooh, row houses, that's just awful. Like why would anybody want to live in these little, you know, I grew up in a, you know, single family communities. There was no, I never saw an attached, well, maybe a semi-attached house, but nothing like that. And I said, oh, this looks like some kind of slum or something. And it was Mount Vernon, <laughs> like 200 plus year old townhomes. These were not row houses. These were like brownstones, we actually. Actually, yeah. Yeah, we ended up getting an apartment, you know, right between on Eager between St. Paul and Charles Street. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. But it was that whole con and he was looking at me like I'd lost my mind. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. What do you mean? This is not like, what are you talking about? And I, I didn't know. I had no point of reference. Only what I thought was true. And mm -hmm. how true is that for life in general, right? Mm -hmm. And for mm -hmm. any business where we make these assumptions, mm -hmm. when you're talking about how you talk to your clients about those things that most people wouldn't touch, I would say, how can we can use that in other aspects of business as well? Any kind of coach, I would think, would want to go down that path ahead mm -hmm. of time with a potential client rather than, oh, God, they're willing to pay me my $10,000 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Let me let me take that and go. 
And I know that anytime I have gone in at anything for the money first, when the bottom line was driving it, I have either messed it up myself, sabotaged it, because it wasn't coming from the, the place for me, or I, I managed to um, be so miserable in it, I had to leave it. You know, when that was the thing driving. So going back to our first conversation that we had here today, getting to know yourself, that's like the major big, that's the overarching lesson for all the lessons, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Knowing who you are, trusting that you know who you are and acting accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Very well said. Yeah. Very I well said. That. Yeah, I just made that up. I like that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what else, Julie? Anything else you want to say before our time is up today? Well, no, I think, um, I think again, when it comes to business, I think that, um, again, going back to what I had said earlier, I said, stick to what it is that you love and be true to that. But also, I think sticking to basics, because I think the other thing, too, is there also needs to be some repetitiveness. And even though that's kind of the boring stuff, the repetitiveness of like I send out a monthly newsletter, I send out uh, the, the, the postcards, I send out the holiday cards. I mean, I think there are things that we have to do in business or that I recommend that you do in business that you stick to, right? Stick to something because I think the problem is, is that there's a lot in business that's fun and exciting, but there's also a lot of in business that's repetitive and boring, mm -hmm. but they're both necessary. They're the both consistency necessary. Consistency is necessary. Consistency yeah. is necessary. And I mean, even people who buy leads, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but in my, my business in particular, and I know this is true of other businesses, people will get two or three or four leads and say, oh my God, they stunk. It didn't work out. I'm done. People don't stick with things anymore. They don't, they don't commit anymore to things long enough to allow them to blossom on their own, to become a thing, to become a generator. Um, so, you know, postcards are boring, uh, putting labels on, you know, 10,000, uh, postcards is boring, but there are, there are tasks that have to be performed in business. Now answering the phone, how many people let the calls go to voicemail, right? So it's, it's, it's this, it's this commitment. And I think it's really comes down to customer service too, because if you think about it, one of the things that you and I have talked about throughout the years is how we don't have customer service anymore mm -hmm. and how we're short with people and how we don't interact and how was your day and how are you doing and just kind of basic human interaction that I think we just don't have anymore. So I think that's, that's important too, is to, is to commit to making one phone call a day or to commit to writing one post, you know, one, one card a day, a thank you card, Committing to these things over and over and over again builds patterns and habits that become the basis upon which we build our successes, right? Mm -hmm. Just constantly plodding along and doing those things that need to be done and, 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 and are a part of, I think, the basics of, of what we used to know as successful in business and we just don't do them anymore. Yeah. Quick, easy fixes sometimes, or we think yeah. easy fixes. It's easy to throw money at stuff, right? Go to this seminar, go to that seminar, find a new technique. How many times have people gone to seminars, learned a new technique, done it for three days and said, oh, that didn't work. That was a waste of money. Right. It's so interesting because I know there's there's some one name I can think of. I'm not going to say it, but there's um, some coaches who have made a huge success of coaching real estate agents. And, and I, I know somebody who's been in one of those coaching programs and it is exactly that template that you're talking about that. And this is someone who's been around and these, you know, so I think often we think we know better than the, the people who've actually done it and been successful with. I know I've been guilty of that. Yeah. Oh, I don't think that applies to me. I'm going to do it this way when it's just mm -hmm. that. And a lot of direct sales people, I think, get into that. They've got somebody in their upline who's highly successful, who has laid out steps they can take. But if it involves something that's the least bit uncomfortable or, or like unknown to us, there's a tendency to think, oh, it won't work for me. Mm -hmm. And so I love this whole back to basics thing. You know, I, I like to think about what do I love to, I love to get a card in the mail. Mm -hmm. So then send more cards, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love to get them. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot of those things. I think the pendulum will kind of swings back and forth, doesn't it? It goes way over to one side where everything was online, it seemed like for some period of time. 
and then people started craving human interaction again. Mm-hmm. So it swung back. And I think I think the the pandemic has actually brought us, it's going to bring us to maybe a nice middle ground with that. Mm-hmm. Because see the value of this, of being online with each other. And we really appreciate the value of being in person again. Mm-hmm. If there's room for both. But it's just anytime we go to the too far to one side or too far to the other, I think we get out of balance. Mm-hmm. And so thank you. Thank you. I didn't know where our conversation would go today, but I knew it would go somewhere really delightful and delicious. So Julia, how do people find you? Uh, www.juliamattis.com or um, my phone number is 410-303-7010. That's my uh, electronic appendage, as I like to call it. (laughs) Or uh, just my name, Julia Mattis, J-U-L-I-A-M-A-T-T-I-S at hotmail.com. Okay. And if they put you in Google, they'll probably find you too. I would most likely. Yeah. yeah most likely. You're out there a lot. So thank you so much for being with us and for sharing your wisdom and your lessons learned. And I was reminded of some things that I know work and I think have been falling by the wayside for me as well. So <clears throat> thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me, Jenny. Yeah. Always good to see you. Yes. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for the Real Women, Real Purpose talk show live in the On Purpose Woman Global Community Facebook group. <clears throat> Excuse me. For a list of the other talk show topics, you can go to the onpurposewomanmagazine.com and we'll start up again next month with some new interviews. And if you really love this interview and you want to share it with friends, within the next 48 hours or so, it will be up on our YouTube channel. Go to YouTube, type in On Purpose Woman Global Community, and that will take you to the channel, which right now probably has over 30 great interviews that are inspiring, informative, educational, and fun. So again, we'll be back next month. Check out onpurposewomanmagazine.com. And thank you so much for being here with us. Bye now.